This video contains spoilers from the world and story of Subnautica. Please beware. The world of Subnautica is undeniably fantastical, filled with sights and creatures that will both figuratively and physically take your breath away. Occurrences which seem to only exist thanks to the developer's wild imagination, without any real roots in science. Yet, as you start to peel back the layers, you might be surprised to discover that many of the things you previously thought impossible do actually exist in some capacity back here on good old planet Earth, or at least theoretically could, and well today, in the second part of a two-man quest to explain some of 4546B's incredible phenomena through real-life science, we'll be looking at an occurrence exactly like that. In this video, me and a fellow YouTuber Speedy Mouse will be taking a look at the science of the Lost River in Subnautica, and more specifically, the brine currents which can be seen flowing through its caverns. If you guys are interested in the first part of this series where we took a look at why the water in the lava zones doesn't boil, you should definitely go check it out on Speedy Mouse's channel, link in the description, but for now, without any further ado, upgrade your Seamoth, get your high school chemistry textbooks, and let's go! To start us off, let's explain the main topic of this video. The Lost River is a frigid winding cavernous area that can be found deep within the world of Subnautica, ranging in depth anywhere from 500 to 1000 meters underwater, or 1600 feet to 3200 feet, and usually being around 4 degrees Celsius or 40 degrees Fahrenheit in temperature. There are many things that make this biome unique the first time you visit. It's gloomy green waters, large skeletons lining the ocean floor, hinting at giant predators which may have inhabited this planet in the past, and, perhaps most importantly for this video, the underwater river. You see, a major part of the seabed in this biome is covered in a thick mist-like brine which forms small currents and pools throughout the area, giving the impression of, you guessed it, a flowing river, underwater. But something like this is surely preposterous, right? How could you possibly have a river situated underwater? Wouldn't all the water just mix and dissolve the substance? And don't even get me started on harming you on contact. Just a fantasy in a video game, right? Well, let's find out. As it so happens, underwater rivers are actually a thing here on Earth as well, though admittedly not very common. In order to understand how they form, however, let's first talk about why some liquids don't mix. In the real world, as many of you know, not all liquids are miscible. A term that describes a liquid that is soluble in another liquid at all concentrations. There can be several factors which contribute to this phenomenon occurring, such as different molecular polarities or external factors like heat, which help increase solubility, but in our case, the most important one will be density or mass by volume. Same as with a helium-filled balloon which floats up because its insides are less dense than the surrounding air, and it is thus trying to get to an area of lower pressure, liquids with different densities will tend to separate as well as long as their molecules remain intact, especially the larger the difference gets. This is why you can get these cool arrangements where you align liquids like corn syrup, water, vegetable oil, and honey to see them stack vertically. The denser, heavier liquids will sink to the bottom, while the lighter ones remain on top. With this in mind, a very common way for underwater rivers to form is that a formed sinkhole slowly fills up with fresh rainwater over time, which erodes the seabed at the bottom, eventually opening up to salty groundwater. When these two types of water meet, instead of mixing, the denser salt water stays at the bottom, forming this misty layer called a halocline, effectively creating what appears to be lakes and even rivers underwater. And honestly, comparing these pictures to the pictures mentioned from the Lost River, I say the resemblance is pretty darn uncanny. Now as we've already mentioned, an underwater river can also technically form as a result of temperature difference between two streams of water meeting, which could definitely contribute to how the Lost River looks, given that it's a frigid biome, especially leading to the lava zones where the water would naturally heat up. As if that wasn't enough, the PDA entry of the brine lily even specifically states that the brine pools at the seabed have higher density than the water above, presumably due to the acid contained within. So, we've managed to explain the appearance aspect of the Lost River. Now onto the perhaps more challenging part, chemical characteristics of the brine. If you've ever played a game and ventured into the Lost River, you might know that besides looking cool, the brine located throughout the Lost River also has another property. It is dangerous. 
Venturing into it without protective gear such as the Prawn Suit or Seamoth will actually hurt the player quite significantly, even with the reinforced Diving Suit equipped, quickly killing them if they don't make it out in time. This however poses a big question of course, is there a real life equivalent to this compound? Something that could not only help form an underwater river, but also seriously damage anyone who swims through it? Well, maybe. After all, from the PDA entry of the Brine Lily, we learned that the brine of the Lost River is acidic, and given the fact that we have no evidence linking the precursors to it, we can also assume it occurs naturally in the biome, so we at least know exactly what we're looking for. Here, however, we run into two major problems when it comes to naturally occurring acids. As it stands, most of them are relatively weak, and on top of that, many also dissolve in water, breaking down into much less dangerous compounds over time. Because of this, generally, if you're looking for strong acids, you'd go for something like hydrochloric or sulfuric acid. But sadly, these don't naturally occur on Earth, in larger quantities or higher concentrations without human intervention. There is, however, one organic acid, which might somewhat fit the bill. The benzoic acid is among the strongest commonly found in nature, being capable of causing some serious discomfort to humans, including eye damage, irritation of the skin, burning feeling, coughing, wheezing, and or shortness of breath. On top of that, though it is soluble in some liquids, water doesn't rank among those. And finally, one of the most common places where you can find it is in the bark of some trees. And go figure, what are most of the roots running through the brine covered with? Exactly. Perhaps due to some unknown process, these roots keep releasing a steady supply of benzoic acid from their bark which settles onto the seabed due to its density, forming the underwater river. Notably, there is technically another acid which at first glance could fit the bill. Formic acid can be found in certain plants and upon exposure has very similar effects on our body. Additionally, it can sometimes be found in the presence of hydrothermal vents, some of which can be found around the area, but unfortunately it easily dissolves in water, so it wouldn't really work. Sadly, even benzoic acid isn't a perfect fit for our scenario because even though it checks, give or take, all the boxes, try as it may, it most likely wouldn't have the stopping power to kill a human in a matter of seconds, especially with something like the reinforced dive suit on. A lot of discomfort, sure. Death in under a minute? Probably not. So where does this leave us? Is it just impossible to explain the Lost River with common science applicable here on Earth? Well, given that Subnautica literally takes place on an alien planet, chances are the plant, water, and even rock compositions might be vastly different from those back here on Earth, and thus, perhaps some acids which don't naturally occur here might be extremely commonplace there. On top of that, we might even be dealing with a completely unique compound, which would, of course, make classifying it impossible. Couple that with the fact that we already know of some crazy planets in our galaxy, where nature just seems to defy all logic, and suddenly, the Lost River doesn't sound so crazy at all. Nevertheless though, today I think we managed to uncover at least a little bit more about how the world on 4546B and specifically the fantastical underwater brine pools of the Lost River work using real life science. So I hope you all enjoyed this video and consider yourselves more educated on how fictional worlds could potentially function using the information we know about our own real one. If you haven't yet, make sure to check out the first part of the series on Speedy Mouse's channel where we explain the love zones and of course, if you enjoyed this video, please consider liking, commenting or subscribing. All of those would be very much appreciated. And if you have your own theories or maybe you're an expert in one of the fields we talked about, we would love to hear more from you down in the comments as well. With that, I want to wish you a beautiful rest of the day and I'll see you in whatever next video I make. Bye bye.